Well, welcome back everybody um, for the next session, which is the update from industry. Um, it's going to be um, a three header. Um, Kate, our research development manager, is going to be looking after us and we're going to have two guests, um, Jens Schaumann from OcuVision and Jennifer Plume from Procure. Uh, uh, Jens is an architect and communicator, and from the, his talk, you will learn about OcuVision and its products and be able to judge his delightful claim that he uses background, his background in architecture to, quotes on, build lasting and sustainable relationships instead of buildings. This will be special. Jennifer is Vice President of Medical Affairs at Procure. She has stunning experience across several disciplines in the pharmaceutical industry and across a number of medical conditions. In her, her talk, we will learn about Procure's work at the forefront of delivering targeted therapies for people with inherited retinal diseases. Jennifer and Jens, you're both very welcome. I'm Kate Arkell, Research Development Manager at Retina UK. The development of a successful treatment is a very long road that starts with basic science in the lab to gain understanding of what's going wrong in a particular condition, through to development of treatment concepts, preclinical testing in cell and animal models, and finally, clinical trials in humans. Even when all of that is successful, there are still hurdles to overcome with regulatory and NHS approval requiring huge amounts of work before a treatment can reach somebody living with inherited sight loss. Charity research funding is essential, especially in supporting the early stages of that development process. Your generous support enables Retina UK to spend around five to six hundred thousand pounds each year on research. And most of our projects are focused on the basic and applied science at the beginning of treatment development. This work is often very exploratory. It always returns a lot of valuable learning, but it's perhaps slightly unpredictable in terms of which direction it will take. As a potential treatment moves forward, its destiny becomes a little clearer, but at the same time, the costs involved start to escalate. For example, a typical Retina UK three-year project costs around 200 to 250,000 pounds whereas a late stage clinical trial will often cost well into the millions. Fortunately, we have our partners in industry, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies to step in, not only investing in later testing and trials, but also undertaking the huge task of applying to regulatory bodies, which requires considerable expertise. These companies do still very much need you, the Retina UK community. They need you to take part in trials, of course, they also need to understand what you want from treatments and how a treatment could best make a difference to your everyday life. This helps them get therapy development right, but also helps them present the potential benefits of a treatment to those deciding whether or not to license it or pay for it via the NHS. After all, you are the best people to explain the impact of inherited sight loss. Some of you have already taken part in focus groups and telephone interviews to share your experiences after our industry partners have asked for our help in publicising these opportunities. A couple of you have even joined patient steering committees for companies to help shape their plans in the best interests of people living with inherited sight loss. So Retina UK very much works alongside the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry. We share a common goal. We all want treatments to become available for as many members of our community as possible. The industry is also able to support our work by providing grants for projects that benefit our community and by sponsoring events such as this one. We work with pharmaceutical companies in an open, transparent and ethical way. There are strict guidelines for working with industry provided by the Association of British Pharmaceutical Companies, which we all work within. Three of our industry partners have recorded short updates that we're going to share with you now. And then I'm delighted to say that they will be joining us for a live Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Hello, 
My name is Jens Schaumann from OcuVision Germany and I would like to talk to you today about our OcuStim therapy. OcuStim has been around for quite a few years and we are very grateful for the opportunity to present here today now that the therapy is finally available in the UK. The OcuStim therapy is an externally applied treatment for degenerative retinal dystrophies. It is suitable for the treatment of retinitis pigmentosa, Usher syndrome, cone rod dystrophy, and choroideremia. Its purpose is to slow down the progressive loss of visual field and preserve vision. The therapy is applied with the OcuStim system, a CE marked medical device. It has been commercially available in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Turkey and Greece since 2011. After individual setup and introduction at the eye clinic, the OcuStim therapy can be used at home. It is applied once per week in a 30 minute stimulation session. The OcuStim therapy works by activating the body's self preservation mechanisms. A weak electric current is applied to the surface of the eye with a very fine electrode thread similar to that you may know from an ERG examination. This activates processes in the retina that help maintain physiological functions and slow down the retinal degeneration. In other words, the therapy helps to preserve the vision by slowing down the rate of visual field loss. It is important to understand that the therapy can only protect what is still there. Lost photoreceptors cannot be restored. The slide shows an illustration of the electrode thread in orange running across the eye just above the lower eyelid. The therapy has been investigated extensively. Over 300 patients have participated in clinical trials to date and used the therapy for a combined 130 years. Among other things, the trials have shown positive visual field and visual acuity effects, improved cone and rod responses in ERG measurements, increased oxygen consumption of the retinal cells, and importantly, no serious adverse events related to the device or therapy. We are particularly looking forward to new data that we will publish later this year that shows the stimulation reduces the rate of visual field loss by an average of 50% compared to non-stimulation. So if you imagine the normal course of the disease with the gradual loss of visual field, it would slow down from the moment you begin regular stimulation and then return to natural progression after terminating the therapy. The study that is beginning now in Germany is a publicly funded investigation into that long-term benefit of the therapy. It should deliver the final evidence for the OcuStim therapy to be reimbursed by German healthcare payers. The study will run for three years from the moment the last of 130 patients is included. The final report and evaluation are expected for early 2026. Unfortunately, however, participation is limited to patients insured in Germany. But we are very happy to say that the OcuStim therapy is available in the UK now. It is currently offered by a private eye clinic in London. Of course, we are determined to make the therapy accessible within the wider NHS in the future. To that end, we are talking with various stakeholders, but we know that the process will still take some time. Until that point, we hope that the evidence and experience we will be collecting here and in Germany will help to build a convincing case to make the therapy available in the UK to all who could benefit from it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Jennifer Klein, I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs at ProQR Therapeutics, speaking to you today from my living room, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. 
Today, I'll talk to you about what we, as a small biotech based in the Dutch city of Leiden and also Cambridge, Massachusetts, are doing in RNA science and inherited retinal diseases. Here are our forward-looking statements. Procure Therapeutics is dedicated to developing RNA therapies for patients suffering from severe genetic retinal disorders with the mission of stopping vision loss or even reversing some of the symptoms. In the field of RNA therapeutics, ProQR is at the forefront of delivering targeted therapies for people with inherited retinal diseases. Our RNA therapies use antisense oligonucleotides, which are specifically designed to correct the underlying cause of the disease in a person's RNA to stop disease progression or even reverse symptoms. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid and is an essential component of all living cells. RNA is used for translation, the process in which proteins are created in the cell. RNA itself is produced from DNA. An RNA therapy is designed to correct the mistake or mutation in the RNA of someone with a genetic disease. By correcting the mistake, the RNA can then be used to create the protein that the cell needs, taking away the underlying cause of the disease. ProCure was founded in 2012 by our current CEO, Daniel DeBoer. A few years earlier, Daniel and his family were faced with the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis in his newborn son, an incurable rare genetic disease. Daniel sought help from the experts in the field of drug development and formed ProCure to help people like his son. When viable treatments in cystic fibrosis came through for Daniel's son, he looked at areas of clear, high, unmet need. ProCure then shifted its focus on eye diseases. Since 2017, we've seen the start of the first clinical trial, Cephalopharsin, for LCA10, and an expansion of the clinical programs to RP with OSH2A mutations and RP due to adoption mutations. It is estimated that over 2 million people in the world are currently living with an inherited retinal disease, but probably even more due to the lack of genetic testing. We believe that the best way to fulfill this mission is to develop RNA therapies for genetic eye diseases. We have built a platform to develop these highly targeted therapies to address the underlying cause of the disease and improve vision. For the vast majority of the more than 2 million people living with an inherited retinal disease worldwide, there is no treatment available and the eventual blindness can occur. And with more than 300 genes identified that cause inherited retinal diseases, there is immense opportunity to develop therapies for people in need. In the field of RNA therapeutics, ProCure is at the forefront of delivering targeted therapies for people with inherited retinal diseases. Our RNA therapies use antisense oligonucleotides, which are specifically designed to correct the underlying cause of the disease in a person's RNA to stop disease progression or even reverse symptoms. Now for a drug to work, it first has to get to the body. RNA therapies work best if they are delivered directly to the affected organ. In the case of retinal diseases, RNA therapies can be injected into the vitreous of the eye, which is a cavity filled with jelly-like fluid. This delivery method is known as intravitreal injection. Intravitreal injection is one of the most common performed procedures for eye diseases. The procedures are performed by eye doctors for common conditions such as age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal vein occlusion. Intravitreal delivery is different from subretinal injection used for gene therapy, which requires complicated retinal surgery. Our proof of concept is clear. In our labs, we work with a very sophisticated retinal organoid model, allowing us to grow so-called optic cups. These optic cups are created from patient skin cells and are handled to create human retina. We have shown that when we add the RNA oligonucleotide to the optic cups, we can repair the particular gene defect. With that, I'd like to close my presentation. I want to say thank you to you as an IRD community for coming along with us on this journey. And a big thank you to the Retina UK group for the opportunity to show our ongoing work and our future partnership. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, very warm welcome to Jens and Jennifer and Kate again. Thank you so much for being here and those excellent presentations. They were really incredibly useful. 
Um, we've got quite a few questions to go, so I'm going to jump right in, if I may. Um, and we've got a question for Jennifer. So why does it take so long to get a treatment from the lab to patients? Surely the COVID vaccination has proven that things can happen very, very quickly. Well, I guess the, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that the COVID experience and these new vaccines have taught us that things should be quick, but unfortunately there are a lot of different processes in place. First, you have to do the preclinical work and you have to go into the clinic in phase one, two, and then you go into the phase two, three. So it takes years to bring a, a therapy to the market. So unfortunately we're not at the, the vaccine level, but I, I wish we were. Yes, the, the the time between proof of concept and developing that drug can be incredibly long, as as we know. Kate, could you give us some sort of idea on the timeline, for instance, for the one example that we have? Yeah, so <clears throat> Luxterna, for example, which is is now available on the NHS in the UK as a gene therapy, uh, proof of principle in the animal model in the dog was around twenty years before it reached clinic in the NHS. So that's that's a, a long time. I mean, hopefully they won't all take that long and, and things will speed up. I think what's helped with the COVID vaccine is that we're very, very experienced with vaccines now and we have vaccine platforms and it doesn't take so long. And obviously with gene therapy and RNA therapies and these new, uh, very cutting edge technologies, uh, there's a lot of work to do to be sure that they're safe and that they really work. But uh, yeah, I think we all uh, we all hope that there's some lessons that can be learned and things might move a bit faster. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Hi, Jens. It's been a while since we've seen each yeah. other. So lovely Hello. to see you today. Likewise. Um, Thank you. I'm going to put two questions together because they're, they're coming in thick and fast now. So um, firstly, can Ocustin be used if there is a macular edema present? And could you tell us a little bit more about the evidence for um, Ocustin's effectiveness? Yes. Uh, first question I can answer very quickly, no. Um, uh, sometimes edema retreats and uh, it would always have to be evaluated by the, by the physician uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, but generally no. Um, the effectiveness evidence is, uh, is based on uh, two clinical trials uh, and... Um, uh, in fairness, it's actually more. Um, it's two clinical trials that have been run by us and uh, another one that has been run by a group in Turkey. Um, if we are looking at um, about uh, 180 eyes that have been treated um, uh, in, in randomized controlled uh, double-blind trials, and uh, the, the effectiveness that can be shown is, uh, is, is based around visual field effects, uh, retention effects of the visual field, um, which, uh, as I said in the presentation, are going to be a uh, subject in a, in a new publication that will come out later this year and uh, that, will, that will be featured at Arvo um as a as a presentation so some of you specifically from the from the professional community may uh you know hear about that evidence in may already but uh, in that we could show um, an up to a 50 percent reduction of uh, the speed of visual field decline um, versus the non-treated eye Thank you. That's fantastic. So a question for all three of you, maybe if we start with Jennifer and then Jens, if Kate has anything to add. When clinical trials are successful and lead to potential treatments like Luxterna, there is always the worry that the cost will be so high that NICE won't approve it um, to be available on the NHS. How can we help ensure this isn't the case and that the treatments that you're wor working towards will reach those who benefit, who will benefit and need them most? Okay, so maybe start with me. Um, yeah. yeah, so we, we have nothing on the, the market yet, but uh, when we do bring something to the market, it goes through you know, intense scrutiny meet scrutiny by the payers so that um, you know, your value that you're bringing to the market is compensated for um, fairly. Uh, so that you know, it takes a lot of negotiations with payers and, and with the um, health technology associations. Uh, and you know it it um, 
you know, it's, it's a matter of what value you bring to the market versus, you know, uh, the investment that you have to make to bring it to the market. So there's a lot of factors that, that come into play. Jens? Yeah, thank you for this uh, uh, question. I think it's a really important and relevant one. And, and thank you for Jennifer for, for your um, answer to this. Um, I think uh, in our case, um, if I may say that the therapy is um, actually fairly affordable compared to um, specifically gene therapies and um, and the likes. So uh, we we hope that the argument can be really made on a on a cost for benefit um, basis. I think you know um, Retina UK have done very good work in very valuable work in, in uh, helping to understand the economical impact of uh, inherited retinal disease. And uh, I hope that we will be able to leverage such information in the future much stronger uh, in order to, to uh, make an argument for trying to halt the progression of the disease whilst uh, it, it still has an impact on um, on a person's uh, on a person's life on a person's working life and their economical performance if you will in in front of uh, you know the payers viewpoint thank you kate um yeah, I mean, thank you, Jens, for the acknowledgement there. We, we, we've done a lot of work to try and capture um, the impact of, of these conditions on people's lives. Um, our community is quite unique in some ways in, the, in that they don't cost the healthcare system a huge amount of money compared to a lot of people living with chronic conditions. But we do know that, the, that our conditions have a huge impact on people's well-being, and as Jens touched on, their ability to, to contribute um, product, to productivity in the workplace and, and for their education to progress smoothly. So um, you, our community, helped us enormously with our, um, our submissions to NICE when Luxterna was going through that reimbursement process because we used so much of your input from our 2019 site loss survey to inform that and to really try and make NICE understand uh, the extent of the impact of these conditions. Some of these treatments uh, are incredibly cutting edge. They're going to be expensive. As Jennifer said, there's a huge amount of investment in their development um, and the manufacturing cost for some of them is incredibly high. So they are going to be expensive. So we have a really important role at Retin UK in tandem with our community in, in trying to ensure that these uh, reimbursement uh, bodies do really understand the value that these treatments can bring to people's lives. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd just like to um, um, further reassert what Kate just said about insight from the community. It really has been key and will continue to be key. So um, thank you very much to everybody um, who has who's listening today who has contributed. It is incredibly important in terms of getting treatments and therapies moving forward. Jens, I've got a question for you. How can OcuSim be approved to use for use, sorry, in the UK by a private clinic, but not by the NHS? And do the same safety and efficacy standards apply? Thank you very much for this question. I know that um, yeah, this, this, this could potentially raise some eyebrows in the from an external uh, point of view. I think um, what we have found in uh, in, in the, the group that uh, that operates this private clinic is uh, is perhaps um, the you know that they have been forthcoming and uh, a little bit more daring enough to um, to <coughs> apply our therapy excuse me on uh, on the basis of the available evidence um, arguments that we have heard from the NHS in the past when we have um, approached NHS institutions was that, uh, that, that the therapy is, um, apart from the evidence base, lacking traction within the NHS. And uh, it's been a bit of a chicken and egg situation trying to convince NHS practitioners and in, uh, in starting to use the therapy on their patients whilst... Um, uh, whilst the evidence was uh, was somewhat uh, more more modest, and um, I, I think this has really been um, a deciding factor in it. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, we hope that we hope that you know with with having one foot in the door so to say in the uk that uh, that we will be attracting more um, attention to to what we're actually doing to the very low risk profile versus the benefit that the therapy can bring uh, in order to to build a case of uh, of broader adaptation in the nhs thank you thank you very much um so i've got a question for jennifer um, mm -hmm. if you are dominant if you are dominant rp can rna therapy still be possible yeah, so I didn't really get into all the different therapies that we're developing, but our platform right now consists of several uh, therapies that are in the clinic. And the first one is for, uh, one of them is for autosomal, autosomal dominant RP, but it's the one that uh, Professor Hardcastle mentioned before. It's the P23H autosomal dominant RP. So we have um, that in the clinic. We also have QR421A for Usher syndrome, because I think there was a question earlier about Usher syndrome. Um, and this is for um, Usher syndrome that targets exome 13 mutations and Usher 2 a uh, And then we have Cepaforsin, which is a CEP290, which is for CEP290 mediated um, LCA10, or Libra congenital amylosis 10. So those are the ones that we have in the clinic, but we have others, you know, we have a whole platform of RNA therapies that we hope to develop. and. You know, each one of these RNA therapies is very, um, very specific. So, yeah, it, it, you know, that's what makes the, the, the journey so difficult in, in developing these because you, when you, each therapy or each trial addresses a certain mutation or variant. Thank you. So um, we're running out of time very, very quickly. Um, I've just got to squeeze one very quick question. Um, so Kate, could you um, give us a very brief overview of why if Ocustim can be made available privately ahead of NHS approval, why can't other therapies such as gene therapies? So um, I think that's partly to do with perhaps the way the regulatory authorities, Jens, correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> treat a device perhaps as separate to uh, a drug or something that's actually going to be injected into the body. So I think um, there's some slightly different regulations around that. Also, as Jens touched on, uh, the costs involved um, are vastly different. Um, so um, gene therapies are running into several hundreds of thousands of pounds potentially. Uh, so realistically, um, there's going to be, you know, the vast majority of us are, are not going to be able to, to cover that cost anyway. So, um, but yeah, I think mostly it comes down to difference in regulation. Um, OQ-STIM is a, is a device and it, it doesn't go into the body. So uh, I think that's probably why um, we can have that distinction. Jens, am I right? I wouldn't have anything to add to that, Kate. <laughs> Very comprehensive. So I think just a, just a rule a rule of thumb is that the, the the separation between invasive and machinery is worth bearing in mind when we're looking at the length of these processes and the difference of processes. Just as a very top line for our community to take away as a as a benchmark for these kinds of activities. So um, we have run out of time and we absolutely have tons of questions that we haven't managed to get through. And if there is anything burning as before, um, we're around all the time. Um, so please get in touch with us at the team if there's anything um, after you go off the conference today that you, you want some further clarification on, please do get in touch. Um, but meanwhile, thank you so much, Jens and Jennifer. We really appreciate you being here. This sort of information is so valuable, valuable, sorry, for this community. So we really appreciate your time. And of course, Kate, thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye.